So before the uh, uh, coffee break, we have uh, one last presentation uh, by Kevin Ottens and David Farr. Uh, the topic is looking at the application developer story. More elitism, anyone? Hello everyone. Um, we thought it would be a good idea to tell you a little bit about some ideas we have on how to make it easier for contributors to get started. In other words, this is going to be a talk about vaporware, just ideas, right? It's not like we have something, uh, some re revolution uh, software to present, but just some brainstorming and the goal of it is to get the brainstorming to continue in a buff session where you guys can tell us what you think. Actually, we have no idea what we're talking about. We just pretend until you're convinced. <laughs> yeah. So basically, the, the plan for this talk is let's have a look at how people get started nowadays uh, hacking on uh, KD software and what would be the ideal developer story, how, how we would like it to look like. And then we'll have a look at the other ecosystems, see how other people solve that problem, and then what we could do about it. So one of the solutions, if you are a new developer and you want to start hacking on something from the KDE uh, world, would be you use your distributions packages. Um, so you have to figure out what to install, right? The full list of develop packages you need, and then clone something, compile it, and install it. And then you can test your changes. That kind of works for standalone applications, uh, by which I mean applications that do not require a lot of uh, very recent libraries from the rest of the uh, KDE software. Um, and then if we have a look at what Qt does, that's like exactly what they do. Um, on their wiki page, there is a list of devil packages for all sorts of different distributions. Um, if I may, uh, since I work with students as well, the part installs the right devil packages and then running CMake until it actually passes. La, um, not this year, the year before, took them two weeks, right? Because we, since we don't document that with the various distros and the various creative names for the packages, right? They had to figure out that out by themselves, right? Yep. So this is the, the list of problems related to that. Uh, it is Unix only. It requires an exact list of packages, and if you think about it, there are many distros and many applications. So if every application needs to document the list of packages for every distro, that's a lot of different lists. And also, I was trying that with um, a friend of mine who wanted to start hacking on Kmail, and basically in his distribution, the PIM libraries were too old for even the stable branch of Kmail, because all of that sort of moves together. So it, the whole approach does not work if the application requires other libs from Git as well. Unless, of course, your distribution is recent enough, and that would be the case with Neon Devel or with the OpenSUSE effort called uh, Argon or Krypton, uh, both of which give you also uh, basically packages built from Git. So that's one solution. Obviously, the problem with that is it requires you to, well, switch to another distro if that's not what you were using, or using the Docker files as was presented earlier this afternoon. Um, on top of that, one of the problems with that is that you have to install before you can run the application. And that's something that has been, uh, so, so you know the problem with that is that you're basically messing up your system with something you just hacked on and then the day after that you have to, I don't know, work on that computer and it's broken and it's a problem. Um, so we would like to make it possible to actually run applications you just built without having to install them, um, and that is tricky. Um, so in some cases, I had, a, I had an intern recently working on some KDE software. What I did for him was to simply automate the install step in the IDE. So when he would do build, it, was, it would actually install and run the thing. But that's only possible if you don't install as root. Otherwise, and the ideal uh, solution would be to find ways to run apps without installing them, and that requires looking at a number of different problems. Um, one problem is different files we want to look up on the file system, like XML GUI, icons, all sorts of data files. That is relatively easy to fix using QRC resources. Um, the support for that has been added already to XML GUI and to uh, the icon theme frameworks. So that's already something that's 
is available and a lot of apps should actually be ported to having the XML GUI file in the resource, for instance. This also helps with uh, deployment on Windows and other kind of situations. For plugins, it's a lot trickier because if you actually build plugins, you want them to be looked up in the build here, and I don't know any other solution than setting environment variables for that. And then if you build helper binaries, you also need a way to find them. That requires being done in the code, I guess, um, and so on. It's, it's a problem that's not fully solved, but we have made progress compared to, well, some time ago. Right. And working with students again, if you don't solve that particular install state, add an extra week to what I was talking about earlier. So you're three weeks down before the guy can make his first patch, right? At that point, he is very motivated to contribute. <laughs> So if we forget about all of that, another solution is, or rather, to solve the problem I was mentioning earlier with, I want to contribute to Kmail, this requires a lot of recent libraries. One solution could be, okay, I'm going to install the devil packages from the distro up to KF5, and then on top of that, I am going to compile all of PIM, or all of Workspace, or all of apps. Um, at that point, you need a tool to automate the compiling of all of that stuff. One solution is KDE source build. Uh, an equivalent solution on Windows would be Craft, which is the new name for Emerge, sorry. Um, so that is kind of a solution, but of course it requires learning that strange tool, KD source build, which does not make it easy for new contributors. Uh, on top of that, you, well, you get to compile a lot of stuff. Um, as I said, it's hard to get started with KD source build. And again, you have the choice between two bad choices. Either you need to install as root, or you start installing stuff into a different prefix and you need to deal with that and make sure it's a layer on top of the rest of your installation which requires a ton of environment variables. So an another solution to avoid the, the whole thing about having different layers and installing as root is to just compile the full stack as user into a custom prefix using KDE source build. Um, the good thing about that is that, well, you eat your own dog food, right? Um, you discover bugs before anyone else. Uh, so that's good and bad if you use that laptop for work, like I do. Um, but the good thing about that is it gives you the ability to debug anything in any application. If, if I find anything that doesn't work the way I want, then I would just go into that and it's already built on my machine. That makes it really easy compared to, oh wait, I need to install new stuff and maybe look at this bug and forget it, right? So that's my solution. Um, I, I forgot to make you people raise your hands. Who is doing development of one repo based on distro packages? Raise your hand if that's the way you develop. Okay, about 10 people. Who's um, building the whole set of uh, repos for PIM or apps or workspace using KD source build? That's actually a more common workflow, well, almost equivalent. And then who's building everything using KD source build? Nice, that's actually the majority. Or more than the other solutions. Cool? So obviously you know the, the problems with that. It's an even larger compilation, right? You get to compile, I don't know, 400 repos. Uh, and you need a ton of environment variables to start with all of that. All of this is fine for, well, some of us people. But obviously if you're a new contributor, this is quite overwhelming. So ideally what we would like to make it possible is for people to just say, okay, I'm cloning this repo here, I want to build it, and it should work even if you know, it has to install dependencies first, uh, or it should be done in an, an environment where the dependencies are there, it doesn't matter, it should just work to clone, build, run the test, run the application, that's the kind of the, the common line story, or if you do, if you do that with a, uh, in the IDE, then you would git clone, open in the IDE, and click run. And with no install step. Yes, as you can see, there is no make install step in there. And this is where Kevin is taking over. Right. And so recently I've been playing with Rust for no particular reason, um, just out of curiosity. And they have this build tool that they use for everything, which they name Cargo. Um, and when you develop or want to contribute to anything with uh, inside of the Rust ecosystem, that's basically you git clone, you call cargo build, you run cargo test, run the test, and you run cargo run to run the stuff you just got, right? That's pretty much what we're after, right? Uh, and they have that consistently on everything in the ecosystem, right? So that's 
really something we would like to have, and we would be happy con key in that case, okay? And so the way it kind of works uh, as a developer is you just provide a cargo to ML file, um, and it's a very simple ini like format. Uh, you specify the name of your package, the actual version, the authors, okay, this kind of me metadata. And then you just specify the dependencies and in which version you want those dependencies. Um, it's able, here I'm using equals in that particular example, but you can say 0 0.3 or above, right, or whatever. Um, and then by convention, if it has an src main.rs file, um, by convention that's an application, and if that's src lib file, by convention that's a library or crate, that's the name they give to this kind of stuff, right? Um, and then straight from Cargo, you can actually publish the result of your work so that it's um, easy to find by other developers, right? So basically, it's publishing mainly the metadata, so where the repo is, who is the author, the actual version, and so on and so on, okay? And that's done with surprise, a command which is Cargo publish, right? And once you've done that, any other developer using Cargo can see your trait, right? And can add it as a dependency, and then automatically Cargo will do the right thing, uh, right thing for him. Um, and by the right thing, what happens in the Cargo uh, universe is basically when you have the run dependency as we had before, it basically git clones for you, right, from the right place and builds it and link to it. Uh, so that downloads a source code and that builds, which is uh, not necessarily ideal, right? And so that asks the question of, is there something similar for C++? Uh, so I didn't quite play with that one, but I just research and see, okay, do we have something? And then it turns out that yes, uh, there's a tool which is named Conan, uh, which is uh, the equivalent for, um, of Cargo, but for C++. Um, it's mainly the same principles. It's slightly more complicated because C++. Um, and one advantage, in my opinion, it has compared to something like Cargo is that Cargo builds really everything, right? All the dependencies you might have, all the dependency tree, it will get everything, build it, and statically link to it, right? Um, obviously, in the C++ world, we are at a stage where that's not necessarily what we want. We want to do some dynamic linking, and we don't necessarily want to build everything under the sun. And so in Conan, the guys who develop that actually accept that, um, and there's a mechanism which allows to have pre-built binaries uh, for your, um, your different Conan packages, and if you are in a situation where the dependency you request is an already known configuration for the build, then you get that, that binary instead of uh, building everything uh, from scratch. Um, so I'm not getting into details there, but there's a mechanism to actually generate for plenty of different configurations and publishing that, so augmenting the chances that you don't have to rebuild when you hit it. And how does it look? Well, pretty much you have to produce a file specific for Conan that looks a bit like uh, any file, and you can specify what it requires. Same thing here, you can say, okay, I need to depend on boost uh, an exact version, or from, I need to depend on Zlib, uh, but something uh, above that particular version. Um, since that's kind of recreating the situation where you have the guy doing the code and the guy doing the Conan package, right? Several people could do the same package for, uh, could do different packages for the same uh, dependencies. So that's why you have this at something uh, that's at the user doing the particular package you interest in, interest in and the branch of that particular package. And then Conan has generators so that uh, generate files on the fly when it downloads and build the, or build the different dependencies. And turns out that one of the generators is CMake, cool, right? And turns out that there's more than that. You could target Xcode, you could target Visual Studio, QMake or Cubes or scones, right? So it already supports all of that. Well, I'm not necessarily thrilled about one of them, but. Um, 
Interestingly, that's not on the slide, but interestingly, they also have uh, generators for IDs, um, or at least for generating config files for, to a low, easy code completion, because then you have to find where everything is installed to have the proper completion. Um, so we could imagine having one, for instance, for integrating in kdevelop directly for the ID side or something like that. And then that asks the question, OK, I'm using CMake, and I, uh, nice, I did the file that I just described. And how do I make sure that when it's built, I actually pick the dependencies kind of found? Well, you just have to add those four lines inside of your uh, CMake file, OK? And basically, you're done. Hmm? Uh, once you have that, um, Conan will do all the work so that you have the dependencies in place. And the Conan basic setup will basically add all the flags necessary to build something so that it finds. Uh, when you do a find package, that's completely transparent, right? When you do a find package, then the find package will look at the right place, OK? Right places, actually. Um, and so in that case, you basically end up doing the git clone, because that's CMake. Then you create the build directory, or not. I generally prefer to do it. Uh, get in that build directory. And instead of just running CMake dot dot, you have to run Conan install dot dot, which does the first phase of generating whatever CMake uh, expects for, uh, for that, which is the Conan build info dot CMake. Then you run CMake, and that we won't find anything from your system, but that will pick inside of your uh, Conan install there. And then you can make your build with CMake, and then you can run ctest and run your binary. Well, you can run your binary assuming that we solve this pesky make install problem, right? Uh, but if we solve this pesky make install problem, we have something which is somewhat much more compelling than before, right? You don't have, at, at least you don't have to find all the right dependencies and so on because it's documented by configuration files and code inside of your repository, so that's even tracked in version. Uh, if we don't solve the make install problem, then we basically have to deal with uh, layers with environments and you end up with n plus two layers uh, because at runtime that means you would have to find whatever you depend on in the system and then whatever plugins and assets which are in your Conan dependencies we, and you have n of them and then whatever plugins and assets you have in your current application okay uh, that's a problem you don't have if the make install problem is solved all right, uh, and I won't get in details in how you publish libraries that you can depend on. That's a slightly more involving than with, uh, than with Cargo in that case. Basically, you write a small recipe, which is um, Python script with particular uh, API. Um, a few interesting things is that it can be tested locally before you publish it. So you can pretend that would be already in the Conan uh, database of metadata and try to build stuff. Um, that can be also uh, checked on the CI. So if you make this kind of recipes, they have all the tooling in place so that you can push that and the CI picks it up and Tanity check it. Um, and we have strong indications that in the case of the KD frameworks, uh, we could generate those recipes. In most cases, we could generate those recipes from the YAML files that we that we have. We might want to make them slightly richer to make the dependencies more explicit, but then we could auto-generate that. OK, if you want to know more about uh, Conan, so there's uh, documentation for the application, so that the URL there for libraries uh, just below. Um, and so we could imagine having the, uh, for if you want something like all of K, uh, KD frameworks, uh, we could imagine making a meta package for that, so like a virtual package which would just depend on everything, uh, or same thing for all apps or all PIM. Or we could imagine having uh, a much smaller KD SRC build, uh, which would do the clone of the leaves uh, of what you need, and then just run Conan in everything. OK, so the pros and cons of using something like Conan, well, that means that we would have clearly locally defined dependencies, which we never had before. Uh, and that could make the work on the CI actually easier, right? Because right now we have this kind of situation where we build everything together in big packages, in part because we don't quite control the dependencies. Uh, 
Um, of course, it works with transitive dependencies, so I don't need to specify everything I depend on, just what I depend on directly and the other ones are pulled. Well, that's what you would expect from package manager. Um, and so the cons is, well, if that dependency has plugins, well, that plugins will end up in some folder controlled by Conan, right? And so that makes it, yeah, picky to find. Uh, the other cons is that it doesn't solve uh, situations when we have conflicts with the currently running uh, runtime, right, uh, of your current workspace like KDED or Akonadi, which are, when we made that slide, we tried to list a few and then we realized that's really the two main ones, right? Um, so obviously if you have something, if you're developing something which needs to be run inside of KDED or one of your dependencies has that, uh, then you might have a slight problem there. It's not necessarily the most common, but that happens. Okay, and then if you're in that last case, right, and you have a problem with runtimes, that's when you basically end up having only solutions with containers, so being a Docker approach, as we've seen, or Flatpak approach, which are fairly similar in some way. Uh, we picked Flatpak for that particular talk just because there's already integration in KDevelop, right? Uh, so Flatpak, for those who don't know, that's used also by GNOME Builder and by KDevelop uh, since recently. So for Flatpak, we would have, instead of having something fine-grained, as we've seen uh, before, right, we don't need to solve the dependencies and make them explicit and so on. So we just create those big, fat containers. Um, so one for the platform, one for the SDK, uh, and that's where you get uh, all your dependencies, and then you just depend on that, right? And you run your application under development on that. Um, you would have, so, ready-to-use containers, and we can imagine the case of PIM, which is probably complexity-wise the worst-case scenario, uh, having a PIM uh, layer on top of that, right? Uh, just a slight example of the manifest in there, so that JSON file, and then you can say, okay, in that particular SDK layer, I want to have K-core add-ons, you can specify the flags, okay, which build system you want to use, and where to find the sources, version, and yada, yada. So using Flatpak for KD apps, how would it look, right? So if we assume uh, that we would have a Flatpak manifest in all of the project, then you could git clone and then download the Flatpak container corresponding to whatever you just cloned and build and install the application you just cloned inside of that particular container, okay? The application would already be there, but if we assume we didn't solve the make install scenario, you just make install and that override that in your local container and then you can run the container. Okay, so that's the type of situation. Uh, so the pros there is that we already have the KDevelop integration. Um, we can have all the dependencies pre-built, um, and you can get started with one click if you use KDevelop. Uh, if you're not using KDevelop, well, no luck for you, right? You will have to learn the command line tools or have to make a wrapper at that point. Um, it's independent from the running system, okay? Whatever distro you have, that's fine. And then it's the solution which actually supports complex runtimes like for the KDD or ACONED situations. Now it has problems as well. Why? Well, it's Linux only, right? Which is a bummer because if we want to see more for apps on Android, if we want to see more for apps on Windows, well then Flatpak is a no-go, okay? Um, the other disadvantage is that, well, that's less finely grained than something like Conan, so you can imagine that you will have a very large payload to download, right, for each of the apps you work with. Um, and also, Flatpak has a very primitive dependency system, so that's in part why we end up with that very fat container. Uh, instead of having plenty of containers we can depend on, uh, each container can depend on only another container. So we basically have only a linear dependency there. And currently that's tied to the ID, which I pointed out. And of course there's the inherent complexity of the containers themselves because you're not running directly, right? So if you're not using an ID hiding that complexity from you, then yeah, that's not ideal. And that leads us to the conclusion. You want to do that one? Yeah. So if we think back about everything we just said, it seems like the best strategy is to first work a bit more on this uh, make install problem, making sure that we can run apps without installing them. 
Um, and then if on top of that we go for Conan, then we have something that takes care of downloading the dependencies um, so that they are recent enough and pre-built so it, it's kind of ideal for getting started quickly. Um, and the only problem with that is the interaction with your running workspace. So the solution for people who want to completely separate the two and not mess up the running workspace is something like a, um, a container like Flatpak or Docker for the uh, alternative solution. So that's what we think would be one way to go. One reason why we layer it that way that, I mean, the make and start is a number one troublemaker in everything we do, right? So if we solve that one, then suddenly for 80% of the applications we do, Conan is viable, okay? And that makes it viable and that doesn't prevent us to get on Windows and so on. And then you're left with the 20 remaining percent where you have to depend on Akonadi, and Akonadi is not easy to port yet, or these kind of situations, then in that case, Flatpak becomes the fallback scenario, right? But at least we suddenly make a much better and more compelling application developer story for 80% of our apps. And it also helps for people looking at uh, deploying our apps on Windows or even OS X. Um, because basically an OS X bundle is also something that's supposed to be self-contained, so you want to find everything in resources rather than somewhere on the file system. So it, it all kind of fits together with these kind of solutions. But plugins are kind of a hard problem in there. So more thinking required. So for following up on that, if you want to provide us with input, uh, we have planned a buff, uh, which is tomorrow at 10.30. Um, and if you, want to know more, if you want to know more about Flatpak, you can go back in time and watch Alex's presentation yesterday, or you can use the recording, which might be slightly easier. So that's it from us. Do you have any questions? One comment, one question. First, the comment, which is happier, I think. Flatpak has another side effect, which is that it's, it, would be it would make deployment really easy. A few days ago, I had to write an app, and I had to package it for a couple of distributions. I wrote it in, what was it, research day or something? For the packaging, it took me two days. <laughs> With Flatpak, this was, well, I, I ended up using Appy much kind of similar thing. So that's, that's a really nice side effect because distributing our apps right now is, is hell. Question. Uh, I, I really enjoy your, your talk and I had a deja vu of Randa 2000 something. Yeah, frameworks, Sprint, many of the things, uh, of the problems, we already came to those. I mean, we have really analyzed those problems. Well, nothing happened or not, not much. Are you guys planning to work on this? Is it in your agenda, or is more of a, let's see what happens, or? No, no, I said this talk is vaporware. We're just trying to get you convinced to do something. No, I think it's, it's something where um, if we all realize the importance of the making soul problem, then any one of us who hits the next problem will say, hey, we've, we've discussed it, it's worth solving, right? And that's all. It's, that actually has changed since Rwanda 2011, because especially the people working on Windows and Mac OS deployment, they have already made quite some good progress in that area, and just you know, su supporting that, that effort and possibly even uh, helping with that is, I think, a very important way forward. So yes, personally, I will be uh, having a look at you know, more precisely what else has to be fixed than XML GUI and so on and so on, so yeah. And, and that's also in part, in my opinion, to point out where our personal hygiene is not ideal and where we stink, right? Because then when you work on something, you cannot, eh, that's based on that, that's not ideal. And I, I'm looking at it right now, right? And it doesn't cost me much to solve that tiny bit right now, right? So it, it's also to r raise the awareness because then we can slowly move there. Uh, was there a reason why you went with flat pack, say, versus app image or, or snappy, for example? Could you? Did you evaluate those and, and look at those? And so well, we can bounce that question back to Alex because basically we had a look at Flatpak because KDevelop supports it. And we were looking at the developer story, so we picked the thing that KDevelop supports. So why Flatpak? That's for Alex. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, we need your 
So yes, I've, I've looked into all of them, and actually, like, app image wouldn't really be a solution in this case because app image doesn't really have a concept of recipes, and well, part of what they want to do is is actually be able to actually compile it for in the first time, like they do in common. Canon plus app image would be a solution, but then it needs some kind of integration. Uh, Snap and and Flatpak are two. Um, formats that we're, we're looking into and both of them would work. The reason why I implemented Flatpak and not um, Snap is because Flatpak works on my distro, Arch Linux, and Snapcraft, which is the tool to build Snaps, doesn't work on, on Arch Linux, at least I don't know how to do that. Also another possibility that uh, we looked into was uh, Dhaka. Dhaka can be reasonably easily used to well both create uh, well patch all of the dependencies and and create the app images but then well what they want to do here is actually to compile them locally so that if they want to modify something they can go through the whole development process so probably wouldn't be the right solution so well flatpak at least it's the the thing that at the moment we can consider more global at least for linux like they said and, and from my perspective, picking one that's really a matter of what is getting traction for deploying to users, right? And right now there's a bit of traction to try to do that with Flatpak. And since we, I mean, we're a free software community like any other, I'd rather reuse something which is partly done, right? And just bend it to my will for another use case and restart from scratch. Yeah. Maybe not so much of a question, more comment. Uh, so in the Qt company, we have been using Conan a bit. We're using it for dependency management in the CI for WebKit, and we uh, had interactions with the Conan developers. It's pretty positive. Uh, they're nice. Um, it comes with its own set of troubles, like uh, verification and so on, but it's trying to be the NPM for C++ or so on. So I personally would really love uh, having the frameworks in there and um, yeah, Qt will be there eventually, I think, and uh, so it's kind of orthogonal, so I think it's definitely worth pursuing also to make visibility of frameworks uh, bigger, so I really applaud that idea. Yeah, because suddenly we would have like plenty of companions. There's l tons of C and C++ libraries which have been packaged for Conan. Oh, one last question. That actually sounds like a reason to publish frameworks over there, even if we don't use it for ourselves, right? That's just, for the PR, yeah. just for the PR part of it and the convenience. Um, regarding the plugin problem with, uh, with running from the build directory, we kind of have that solved in Gamma Ray. The trick is that the build directory needs to have the exact same layout as the installer directory, which is a few lines of CMake code. And then the, um, we have code that in the library doing the plugin loading. Um, that can localize the absolute path of the library itself, and then you basically just add the, from there you know where your plugins are based on the relative install paths, so you add that yes, to the... Yes, but that's the easy case. That's the case where you are building plugins for your own application, then you control the, the plugin loading and you can add extra search paths, yes. But what if you're building a Qt plugin or a KMA plugin, or right? Then it's... Right then you need it loaded by some code that you don't control. And then, apart from environment variables, I don't know any better solution. But yes, this solution is valid for these cases, yes. Uh, thanks, Kevin and David. And with this, we end this uh, session. And there will be a short coffee break. And after that, we'll start at 18, 17.55, sorry. Cool, thank thanks. you.